For a decade now, Syria has seen a situation that has left many dead, many refugees and a generation destroyed. The Syrian refugee crisis is the worst refugee crisis the world has seen in this century. India has stepped up its efforts. With me is the Syrian Foreign Minister who is here in Delhi for conversation with the Indian leadership and of course also with Vion as well. So welcome to Vion. My first question to you is an obvious question when it comes to relationship with India. How do you see the relationship but also when it comes to the evolving situation in Syria. If you can talk about the situation, how the situation is presently in your country and given the fact that many of course have been talking about an improvement in the situation if you can shed some light on that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, let me comment the introductory part of uh, of course Syria passed through a very difficult time. Uh, terrorists from uh, many countries in the world particularly from western countries invaded the country through neighboring states like Turkey. Uh, they believed that within the framework of the so-called Arab Spring, they could affect a regime change in Syria. Uh, they were thinking it may take them one day, two days, three days, ten days, as happened in different Arab countries. Uh, finally, the situation in Syria was not like that, because the people in Syria believe uh, in their homeland, they love their homeland. They believe that uh, they have been led very well uh, by President Bashar al-Assad. And uh, what the Western countries were thinking uh, collapsed. And this, of course, resulted in a uh, forced uh, immigration from the country. Uh, the government has never, ever uh, told people to leave the country. It was under the pressure of the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the terrorist groups uh, who have uh, demolished the infrastructure of the country, who have uh, forced people to leave the country to become refugees. But as I told you, uh, uh, we, we have the, the, the uh, uh, confirmation that on the Syrian-Turkish border, uh, the uh, camps were built beforehand for the ref expected refugees mm -hmm. uh, because they had the intention to intensify the situation in a way that will convince people to leave. Who had the intention? Uh, the terrorist groups and the neighboring countries who were supporting mm -hmm. these terrorist actions. Can you list the uh, neighboring countries? Of course, the United States, European countries, mm -hmm. uh, Turkey, uh, among others. I don't want to go back 12 years now uh, because we are trying our best to make the relationship with all our neighbors as ordinary as possible uh, and uh, allow the people who left the country by the force of the uh, terrorist groups to come back. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know who is preventing them from coming back? It is the Western countries and some international organizations who are saying all the time, no, the time is not ripe for refugees to go back to their own country. Mm -hmm. Of course, we in Syria are telling every refugee to come back because when they come back, they come to their home, they come to their property, they come uh, to their country. Mm -hmm. And there is not a single individual who is not allowed to come back. Mm -hmm. But of course, after the devastation you referred to, uh, people uh, should refer, uh, I mean, back to uh, the situation that exists before they leave. Before they leave, they had houses, they have properties, they have land, they have uh, work, they have everything. Uh, with the uh, activities, destructive activities of the uh, uh, terrorist uh, I mean, groups, some people may have no homes anymore. Some people may have homes, but they need repair. Some people, those who, whose houses were not affected, can come back to their houses. We promised these people, if you come back, if the government can help, of course, we shall help repair the house. Uh, if uh, the house is not existing, then 
the government made it possible for others to go to uh, houses built by the government for these specific cases until the people rebuild again and go back to their houses. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Western countries are saying is absolutely out of mind, out even of any humanitarian sense. No, the situation is not right mm -hmm. because they want to keep this issue of Syrian refugees as a hanging sword that will prevent people from going back to normalize the situation in their respective country. Mm -hmm. So the situation that erupted in 2011, uh, the civil war, to use the phrase, is the civil war over now? Is Syria safe for everyone to go, including the refugees? Are you trying to say that, sir? The, there, there has never been a civil war in Syria. We have to start from this point. What was there is a terrorist war against Syria. And uh, the Syrian people were not fighting each other. Nobody fought against their neighbor or against, uh, I mean, their neighboring village or their neighboring city. It was a terrorist war against all Syria. Those who left Syria were forced to leave the country. Either you leave or you are killed. And do you know the number of these terrorist groups? I mean, it reached something like 400,000 terrorists coming from different countries, mobilized by money, by moral propaganda support and everything. Uh, then we have to fight. Of course, our friends uh, uh, were ready to help us. Uh, our Russian friends, our Iranian friends, in a different way, our Indian friends. I mean, all of them have rallied to help Syria overcome this difficult uh, terrorist war against the country. Mm -hmm. And finally, the majority of the territories in Syria are in the hands of the government. And now the people are coming back. Every day, we have tens of people coming back from Jordan, from uh, Lebanon, from Turkey, and from other parts of the world. So, so what is the situation now in terms of the fact that uh, has there been a return of normalcy? And if you can perhaps talk about or give details as to who is fighting whom right now, because there are several elements, including foreign elements on your territory. This is a very good question. Uh, as far as the first part of the question is concerned, yes. Normalcy is returning back to the country. Uh, we invite you to come to Syria to see by your own self that in all governorates under the control of the government, which is the majority of Syria, uh, the situation is normal. People are rebuilding, people are uh, uh, growing their uh, products, uh, people are returning to a normal situation. Of course, we have to speak later about the effects of the uh, unilateral coercive measures, what we call uh, unilateral sanctions imposed by uh, the United States, by America, on all other countries which means if an Indian company wants to help Syria, uh, it will be under sanctions at the same time. So now, uh, the situation is returning to normalcy, except in two uh, uh, parts. In the Northwest, where Turkey together with Daesh and the so-called Jabhat al-Nusra are occupying this northern uh, part of the country, uh, and of course, there are discussions now on how Turkey should withdraw from this part of Syria because when it comes to Daesh and to Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, we are ready to uh, take our own responsibility. But we don't want a uh, full large-scale war between Syria and Turkey because this will never help neither Syria nor Turkey. So we are trying to uh, find a way out. Of course, uh, nobody can anticipate what the reaction of the Turkish government, because the Turkish government is a Muslim Brotherhood government. That's why they supported Daesh. That's why they supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria. That's why they supported Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, let's hope that uh, at the end of the exercise or the game, Turkey will understand that it is in its interest to withdraw from Syria on the one hand, and secondly, to stop its support for terrorist groups. This is very important because any activity of terrorism will be directly influencing the situation inside Turkey. Mm -hmm. 
we are two neighboring countries. When, once you have terrorists in Syria, this means at a certain time they will go back. Mm -hmm. The birds will go back to, re to roost. So, and Turkey has started to suffer such uh, uh, consequences mm -hmm. of their own policy of supporting terrorism. Okay. In the Northeast, it is the United States occupying that part of Syria, supporting also some terrorist groups, some separatist groups, uh, uh, dominating the... Uh, this is, in fact, the, the, the best place in Syria for the production of oil, for agriculture, for cotton, for wheat. In fact, it is the food basket of Syria. So now the United States is controlling that part I think, in a way, either to weaken Syria or to prolong the crisis so that it enables its own agents to uh, be active there in a way which will divert the attention of Syria and Syrians from the main challenges they have to face. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about the terrorists, war against terrorism, and of course terrorists in your country, foreign terrorists. If you can perhaps Tell us the number, how many countries foreign terrorists came from, and were there terrorists in your country from South Asia? I think uh, terrorists came from many countries in the world. Uh, some of these terrorists were sent by their own governments uh, or financed by uh, Western governments, uh, armed by Western governments, and by those countries in the region who were... Uh, misleading themselves in a way that will, uh, they were thinking these terrorist actions will end in one week, two weeks, three weeks, as happened in some Arab countries, or one year, two years. But then finally, uh, they found out that the Syrian people the, support their own government, and they are ready to sacrifice for supporting their own government. In addition to the help we received from our allies and the friends in the international community, those countries who did not support terrorism. Uh, in fact, I cannot claim that uh, all uh, the countries from which came some terrorists into Syria were supportive of these uh, terrorists. Uh, it is said that more than 80, 90, uh, 80 90 uh, countries have sent or terrorists came from more than 80 or 90 countries of the world to Syria. Uh, finally, they are now in a camp controlled by uh, pro-American uh, force. Uh, in that camp in the Northeast, under the American control now, more than 68,000 terrorists with their families are concentrated there. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the magnitude of the terrorist action organized against the country to contribute to its failure, to its collapse. These terrorists have, in fact, I mean, devastated everything. Uh, the electricity, uh, the agriculture. Uh, the United States is now smuggling our own, our own oil from that part it occupies because it is almost always all full of oil into neighboring countries, exporting it to uh, uh, Turkey and to other countries. Imagine what they are doing. So now, in Damascus itself, uh, as I told our uh, Indian uh, uh, friends, uh, we have only uh, electricity for two hours run on and four hours of cut off. And sometimes even electricity does not uh, come back. Before 2010, the entire Syria, including in the desert, electricity was coming home 24 hours a day. Now it is only around two hours. Mm -hmm. In some places, we don't have electricity at all. That's why we need our, the help of our friends from India, from Russia, from all those countries who look uh, to helping uh, others and eliminating the menace of terrorism that may spread out of Syria. If they succeeded in Syria, in fact, they would be here in India, they would be in uh, neighboring countries, 
Of course, Daesh was there in Iraq, in Jordan, and uh, even in other countries. So what's the status of Daesh, the Islamic State, uh, right now in your country? They, are, they, are, they, they still have some elements. These elements are manipulated by the United States and other European countries. Sometimes they uh, give them enough power to be active in Syria. Sometimes they take them to other countries. They took these Daesh elements to Afghanistan. They are taking them into some African countries where they have to fight the wars of the Americans and the French, among others, in Africa or in Asia. So they are spreading everywhere at instructions from the United States and Western countries who claim they are against terrorism. But in fact, they have beefed up all the activ terrorist activities in order to affect a regime change in Syria. I don't want to go into deeper analysis of why they targeted Syria, but in fact, they did not target Syria only. Egypt was a first target, Iraq was another, Yemen is a third. Uh, Tunisia is a fourth, Libya, Algeria during uh, the uh, 10 uh, years of suffering the effects of terrorism and the Muslim Brotherhood war against the people of Algeria. In Sudan, the battle is still going on. You can imagine how devastating these Western countries' policies were on different Arab countries. So, but what happens to the future or the fate of these foreign fighters or their family members as well while they wait for acceptance when it comes to these foreign governments? Uh, we are promising that uh, these uh, foreign terrorists should not come alive out of Syria. We did our best. But some elements are still there, as I said, with the support of the United States, among others. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to work together with all peace-loving countries, those countries which are active in the fight against terrorism, to eliminate all of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said before, the United States is sending them all over the world, wherever they want to affect a regime change or political exercise, political pressure, then they use them in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so. If you talk about Arab Spring, which was something that toppled many governments in the region, and that is the point when Syria started to deteriorate, the situation started to deteriorate. How do you see that year, 2011, or Arab Spring, a decade from now, today? Uh, it was anything but a spring. You know, springs in India and Syria are the most beautiful seasons. But this was, uh, I mean, some people, I don't know if, if it is correct to call it winter or autumn, but uh, it is anything but not a spring. Uh, so, uh, as I said, it was a uh, uh, it was destruction. It was war that eliminated hundreds, if not thousands, of people, innocent people, who were uprooted from their homes and forced to uh, immigrate into other countries to go into the sea where hundreds of them found their fate there. They found only dead until recently, because Turkey is manipulating the issue of refugees to threaten Europe. If you don't give us five, ten billion dollars per year, then we shall open the gates of these refugees to go to European countries. And each year, Europe is being blackmailed into paying the Turkish government huge amounts of money so that they don't use these Syrian refugees to go to European countries. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much manipulation has taken place during the past 10, 11 years. And so how do you see the ongoing protests in Iran? Uh, do you think that there is a certain kind of parallels when it comes to the Arab Spring or 2011 and the protests happening in Iran right now? Let me be very frank with you. Uh, of course, we do not interfere in other countries. Mm -hmm. I was recently in uh, Tehran, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the situation is calming down. Uh, but what I have to tell you with all honesty, all the tactics being followed and taken over by the uh, terrorist groups in Syria are happening exactly the same way in uh, Tehran. Propaganda. Uh, social media, 
uh, writing on walls, uh, accusing the government of always killing the people. In Syria, we had some of these protesters against the government killing some innocent civilians just to provoke a confrontation between the government, between the police of the country, and the, to give the impression the government is killing its own people, which is absolutely not crazy, but out of mind. I mean, only people who are irresponsible can use such pretexts to attack another country. Uh, in Iran, the same thing is happening. Of course, uh, the Iranian government is dealing the way it has to deal with these kinds of, uh, I mean, actions. But a, a big part of the same, exactly the same tactics were followed in Iran uh, as they were followed in Syria uh, against the legitimate government of the country. Can Syria be that balancing power when it comes to the Arab world and Iran? Uh, this has been our wish, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, our, uh, you know, Syria uh, is a pan-Arab, uh, I mean, uh, believer. We believe in the Arab unity in all Arab countries. And uh, when the Iranian revolution have started a new page uh, of cooperating with the Arabs for the liberation of their occupied territories, then Iran started to face the problem. Now, one of the major calls by those who are provoking these developments in Iran is to uh, change the policy of Iran from being uh, a country supporting the right of the Palestinian people for liberation, for the establishment of their independent states, and saying, what have we to do with the Palestinian people? We have nothing. Be because the Western countries are pressurizing Iran to change its policy on the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. And Iran has become to say, no, we are ready to fight with, alongside the Arabs to liberate Palestine and the occupied territories. That's why there is so much hatred by Israel and by the Western powers against the Republic of Iran. Nowadays, of course, uh, we want the best of relations between Arab countries and the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. We don't find any justification uh, for why uh, some Arab countries are finding the, finding the menace coming from Iran, not from Israel. And, uh, of course, we are trying all the time to convince our Arab brothers that the main danger is coming from the occupation of Palestine by Israel, not from Iran, which is trying to help Arabs liberate their occupied territories, whether it is in the Syrian Golan, or what remained under Israeli occupation in southern Lebanon, or uh, building a Palestinian, an independent Palestinian state. So we don't, we found only uh, the necessity of establishing fruitful cooperation between the Republic of Iran and different Arab countries. Mm -hmm. And of course, when differences arise, Syria is ready to intervene and to solve any kind of problem in the interest of both sides, because we don't find any justification for this conflict between some Arab countries and Iran. So at the United Nations, uh, you have consistently supported Russia when it comes to the conflict, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. What's your view, essentially? I mean, why are you supporting Russia? Because at a time we have seen that large part of the world are very angered by the situation erupting in in Europe that has led to escalation in food fuel prices. Also, when do you see a resolution of this conflict? What's your view when this conflict can come to an end? Another good question. Very complicated. Uh, but we have taken out our stance in supporting Russia. You are correct. I mean, we, we support Russia in this conflict. First, because we have seen uh, the West advancing uh, towards uh, occupying uh, different uh, countries in the, uh, uh, I mean, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, different countries, I mean, were established, of course, we recognized them. Uh, but uh, when NATO was not satisfied with this achievement, they want now to bring all their missiles into the doors of Moscow. This, in fact, is the uh, uh, philosophy we found 
that justifies any action by Russia. Of course, not to mention any uh, rights for, the, uh, for Russia to uh, act in favor of its uh, Russian uh, uh, people uh, inside the Donbas area. This is first. The second issue is the double standard policies of the Europeans and the Americans. Israel has been occupying our territories for 70 years. Until this minute, the Western countries and the United States are supporting Israeli occupation. They are not helping any peaceful settlement. How can we have confidence in them when they are play, playing this double standard policy? They are against Russia, but they are supporting Israel. So we have to be logical in our analysis of the international situation. Thirdly, Russia has always supporting, uh, supported the rights of the Palestinian people, supports, supported the right of the Syrian uh, government to restore and liberate the uh, occupied Syrian Golan, and to uh, help Arab countries bring about uh, more uh, technical advancement. And Russia is helping us all the time while the West has caused, I mean, the so-called Arab Spring, the devastating Arab Spring in our countries. Mm -hmm. It is natural, I mean, if you are suffering such effects from the Western countries, it is natural to support the politics and the understanding of, the, uh, of Russia. Mm -hmm. Fourthly, I think we, we have to believe in a multipolar system. The United States and Western Europe cannot impose on all our countries their hegemony and their control. In fact, by planning to use Ukraine against Russia and then to contribute to the collapse of the Russian Federation, the hegemony by the United States on international politics will be further uh, deepened because this was, will be their last uh, effort to control the world. And we are not for that. We are, as I said, for a multipolar system where India is there, where China is there, where Russia is there, where Western countries are there, uh, where Africa is there, where, I mean, uh, Latin America is there. But we cannot tolerate a unipolar uh, system that will culminate in the absolute hegemony by the United States and its designs uh, on all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. These were, in fact, uh, our political, ideological uh, ways of understanding these developments that have taken place in uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the presence of foreign elements, you've talked about Turkey, you've talked about America. Are the Russians also somewhere involved in terms of perhaps supporting you? I mean, are they on the ground in Syria or supporting you in capacity building? We have a lot of friends. Uh, uh, for example, India does not have uh, force. Uh, we respect the position of India. But they understand that if terrorism succeeds in Syria, then uh, India is neighboring of Arab countries, mm -hmm. neighboring of Islamic countries, and so on and so forth. So uh, on the ground now, we have Russians uh, helping us. Mm -hmm. We have some Iranian experts, not army, mm -hmm. uh, helping our forces because the United States and Turkey mobilized tens of countries in the war against Syria. Mm -hmm. So it is natural to have uh, a receptive uh, view of welcoming any help coming from our Russian friends from, or Indian friends. Uh, from uh, many countries in the world. And uh, to be very frank, I mean, the United States is trying to give the impression that uh, Syria is isolated. We are not isolated. We are uh, including among Arab countries, almost all Arab countries, almost. With the, let me put it clearly, with the exception of one, two countries, all Arab countries have embassies in Damascus and we have embassies in their respective countries. And we have embassies in many European countries. Mm -hmm. Our embassy is still functioning in Paris. Our embassy is still functioning in uh, Berlin. Our embassy is in Warsaw, in Budapest, in uh, Athens, in, uh, in Greece, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in Rome, and among others. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Asia, uh, 
the number of our embassies uh, did not uh, was not affected. We are still having an Indian embassy in Damascus, and a, very a Syrian active embassy, one, a very, uh, very active, active Syrian one, embassy, uh, Syrian embassy in uh, Delhi, uh, other embassies in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and uh, China, among others. Mm -hmm. So we are there. Uh, before I go to India part, uh, which is the last segment of the interview, one last question. I know the answer, but still I want to hear what is your view. When it comes to Israel, we know there are a lot of issues. Where do you see a kind of relationship? There is no relationship, but where do you see situation going on between you, the two countries? Given the fact that several Arab countries under the Abraham Accords have formalized their relationship. I think you, you are right. Uh, we don't have the, to deepen the division between Syria and Arab countries. We have to work for points where we can understand each other. Uh, where we don't uh, create uh, more conflicts, but create uh, a situation which will make Arab-Arab uh, relations uh, uh, better, rather than deepening the divisions. Uh, uh, recently, uh, the Arab summit was held in Algeria, and we told them, don't make Syria an issue of uh, contradiction among Arab countries. Uh, the most important thing in our relation with Arab countries is to make the best kind of relation with all Arab countries. Mm -hmm. Of course, we shall, I mean, at a time, uh, I mean, Arab countries uh, will come to understand the real situation, will understand the position of Syria mm -hmm. on these issues, uh, but uh, we shall not allow any uh, single issue to be a dividing uh, point between Syria and the Arab countries. But Syria and Israel, where do you see the future like? They, they occupy our territories. If, we, if they uh, believe in just and comprehensive peace, Syria will be ready to establish this comprehensive peace. But there will never be peace uh, while Israel is continuing its occupation of the Syrian Golan and denying the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. But we started a peace process in the 90s of the last uh, century uh, and it became very clear that Israel wants both the peace and the land, mm -hmm. which is impossible to accept. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, done a great job uh, to establish the peace that we wanted, but Israel has been rejecting uh, all our attempts with the full support from the United States and the European countries. Mm -hmm. So now coming to the India part, you were here in Delhi, you met with the Indian External Affairs Minister, what were the conversations like and what do you see future like uh, when it comes to relation between Damascus and New Delhi? Uh, during even the most difficult times of the Syrian conflict, I mean 2013, 14, 15, these were the most difficult years, mm -hmm. uh, where even we in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Damascus uh, were receiving uh, the uh, rockets uh, fired by the terrorist groups from uh, nearby places, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention all parts of Damascus. Uh, at that time, uh, the Indian embassy in Damascus did not hesitate to continue to function the way it functioned. Secondly, during that difficult time, some Syrian delegations came to Delhi and some delegations from Delhi came to Damascus. India has a great people. India has uh, uh, correct, wise analysis of the situation in the region because, uh, I mean, it takes us four hours to travel from Damascus to Delhi. Uh, so you can understand the proximity of, uh, I mean, time and space. Uh, whatever is dangerous for Syria is at the same time dangerous for India. We are both uh, secular countries. Uh, we believe in uh, democratic principles and we uh, are determined that this strong, these strong ties of civilization, of democracy, of uh, exchanges. I don't know, they go millennia in time, back in time. Uh, 
people speak that uh, the relations existed before even human beings were, I mean, uh, in a position to understand the relationship between themselves. Uh, so these relations existed and are deep in history. Mm -hmm. They are still going deeper and deeper every day. Mm -hmm. The people of Syria have a great respect for India. The Indian people, wherever I go, I mean, we, we find uh, uh, receptive uh, uh, ways and means of welcoming us. So we have to strengthen the economy of the two countries. We have to strengthen uh, the war against terrorism. We have to uh, cooperate on the establishment of uh, a multipolar system. We believe that India should be a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. We believe India has to play its role because it is a great role. India is a great country and is a great uh, people. So. Uh, I have, uh, w usually when we meet with our counterparts, Indian counterparts, we only found understanding. Uh, I didn't find any issue where we differ. Uh, on the contrary, sometimes we exchange views on how to, do, to deal with certain challenges together. Mm -hmm. And this has been the line followed by Syrian diplomats and Indian diplomats. So, we really uh, appreciate the contribution of India, the humanitarian contribution of India. Uh, more than half a ton of rice was sent to Syria by India some years, two years ago, at the difficult time where Syrians did not find food to eat, did not find rice to, uh, to eat. And uh, this is the nature of relations between these two sisterly countries. Mm -hmm. uh what next after this visit? I mean, uh, this is a visit coming after some time, the last foreign minister to visit Delhi from Syria was 2016. Can we expect a high-level visit from India and perhaps a higher level visit from Syria to Delhi? Uh, don't be surprised to find all that. Uh, today I am here, uh, tomorrow I don't know who will be there in Damascus, uh, but uh, we have agreed. Uh, that uh, these visits, uh, of course, not for the sake of visiting, but they have in them a cultural background, they have in them economic cooperation, they have in them, as I said, the war against terrorism, they have cooperation with the United Nations and other international organizations. Finally, we are an Asian country. Mm -hmm. You call us Western Asia. So uh, here is the heart of Asia. Mm -hmm. And the Western wing cannot function without the heart. Mm -hmm. The heart is uh, India. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are together and uh, yes, we agreed to boost our uh, economic cooperation. Nowadays, we are enjoying a great support on the way of rebuilding the country. Mm -hmm. After the devastation by the terrorist groups of the country, now uh, India is taking the, the task of helping Syria rebuild. Uh, there are hundreds of scholarships from ITIC given to Syria. There are uh, thousands of scholarships given uh, each many years uh, to rebuild our educational system and to uh, uh, rebuild the destroyed uh, uh, schools and uh, I mean other facilities and to uh, work together to see uh, in which world we can both live. Because both of us believe in the same principles and the same ideals. Mm -hmm. So my last question to you is India has also been sending support in terms of prosthetics and the readout. This was really great. Uh, and, and the readout from the Indian side on your conversation with the EM talks about steel plant and, and power plants, support for that, line of credit for that. If you can also give details when, where this project is going to come. You know, at a time uh, when humanity does not mean anything for uh, Western powers, uh, we found all human uh, noble concepts uh, prevailing uh, in Indian uh, foreign politics. It's not only in Syria. It is, I mean, for any country that is suffering. Uh, I didn't want to go and enumerate the fields in which India is uh, helping Syria, but I can tell you directly that uh, 
India did not spare any effort uh, to help Syria at this very difficult time and to move uh, ahead with the economic cultural relations that have all I mean uh, always linked Syria together with India. Mm -hmm. And do you see India's role? I mean, there is a role for India, obviously, but how much role you see for India in terms of the West Asian political crisis, a region which is obviously mired in a lot of crises? India is uh, always expressing very clearly its political stance. Now, India is a member of the Security Council and uh, a member of different uh, specialized organizations of the United Nations. We have found Indian support for our, I mean, just causes and for other just causes in the world uh, always being given. Mm -hmm. So uh, India is not uh, uh, a country that hesitates when the question comes to helping people uh, get free, uh, get democratic, and uh, get uh, more independent. Mm -hmm. So all the principles that apply to India and the Indian people by the Indian government are also applicable by India to other uh, countries and nations. So we highly appreciate this role being played by India and uh, will never ever hesitate to develop and deepen the relations between our two countries. Mm. Well, on that note, sir, it was a pleasure having you with us uh, here at Vion. And of course, uh, a very nice interview touching about almost every issue, of course, on New Delhi as well. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Have a nice day.